Diplomacy. I don't know if any of you have seen Dunkirk or The Darkest Hour. Goldman might be our Academy Award winner. Gary, o Gary Oldman, I'm sorry, might be our Academy Award winner. I highly suggest the movie. But the quote that stands out in my mind that reflects what we do every day is about diplomacy, the art of telling people to just go to hell in such a way that they will ask you for directions. I mean, it is diplomacy on what we do when we communicate. And Winston Churchill is the master communicator of the 20th century. So clinical practice guidelines. I'm going to just show you a summary of mechanical ventilation in adult patients for ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And in their summary, this is the bottom line of evidence base for all ARDS patients, low tidal volume ventilation, strongest recommendation with some level of PEEP, and this is a, an important caveat to keep the plateau pressure below 30 centimeters of water. Now, the low tidal volume is four to six milliliters per kilogram ideal body weight. But there is no provision on what level of pressure you need to provide, like plateau pressure, on a patient. Now, I'm sure some of you have remembered some guy named George Orwell, 1984, animal form. All animals are created equal, some more equal than others. Well, I don't think all humans are equal when it comes to body weight. So we have seen 70 kilogram, 100 kilogram, 200 kilogram patients come in. What kind of pressures do they need to inflate their lungs? I will tell you, you will never inflate a 200 kilogram patient lung to give you a plateau pressure of 30. You'll never inflate it. They'll never get ventilated. You have to go to 40. You have to go to 50. So this caveat is a huge published error. I have patients at plateaus of 40 and 50 when they weigh that much, and you can ventilate them. And they, you won't destroy the lung because it's the distension pressure that's important. It's not the full plateau pressure because you have to get the diaphragm out of the way, especially with these large chest patients. Another strong recommendation that came out of this report that is a bit contentious is prone positioning. Higher PEEP and recruitment maneuvers receive a moderate to severe conditional recommendation, moderate to severe ARDS for this conditional recommendation, and high frequency oscillatory ventilation in adults. In adults, with moderate to severe ARDS should not be used, strong recommendation. Now for ECMO, severe ARDS, no recommendation for, no recommendation against. These are the facts, this is the evidence, this is the bottom line. There's no FDA approval, evidence-based recommendation to use ECMO for ARDS. Well, let's back up, what is ARDS? ARDS is a syndrome. It's a constellation of observations of non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema from lung inflammation. The focus is on a PFIO2 ratio, the actual partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood gas divided by how much oxygen is being delivered gives you a ratio. This is important to know. The lungs are stiff. Baby lungs has been described. Uh, by decreased lung compliance, increased elastance. There's a pathology we describe called diffuse alveolar damage to pathogenesis. We have no idea. It remains elusive. There's no gold standard diagnostic test, but I think an important thing to keep in mind, these are people who are otherwise healthy, such as a patient who came in with influenza recently, working at a restaurant, and then suddenly he can't breathe or he can't have his heart beating properly three days later. This particular patient, it escaped hitting his lungs, it hit his heart. So probably the diagnostic of tests is usually when it occurs within seven days of, in, of in, some inciting event. Acute inhalational injury, for example, uh, could be a possibility. There are mimics. Patients can have acute cardiogenic shock and pulmonary edema, acute bacterial pneumonia, acute alveolar hemorrhage, acute eosinophilic pneumonia, hypersensitivity pneumonitis from fungal infested areas that have been previously flooded. Alveolar protonosis, very rare condition. Acute interstitial pneumonitis, a very rare condition. Drug-induced and connective tissue disease-induced interstitial lung disease by particularly poly polymyositis. The bottom line here, here's somebody with a small heart, whited out lungs with a Swan-Gans catheter, say, and the pressures are fulfilling are low. This is non-cardiogenic. 
this would fit the ARDS criteria. But let's center around this PFIO2 ratio that's going to go on a transition and change by the Berlin criteria. If you're below 300 with that inciting event within seven days, you very well likely will have ARDS. You do need an echocardiogram to prove it's not cardiac or some cardiac dysfunction or valvular abnormality. It's now been graded to mild, moderate, and severe. So if the ratio is less than 100, an easy way to think about it, what's the arterial blood gas show on somebody breathing 100% oxygen? If it's 98, they're considered to have severe ARDS in somebody who doesn't have a shunt, who was otherwise healthy a few days ago, and literally a few days ago, such as people working full time, and now they're entering our ICU in such a condition. The JAMA article showed almost a dose response curve in this re regard when you go to mild to moderate severe ARDS where the mortality rate, these are survival curves, it's not quite the same, mortality inverse of survival is not quite the same, but we could say the mortality rate here would be 42% as they would point out here, but actually the survival rate's just below 60 in those that have severe ARDS. The mortality rate is a different look at it. This is a statistical problem. 27 to 45% is the mortality rate for ARDS in general. The more severe, the higher the mortality. The more severe, the lower the PFIO2 ratio, getting below 100 and further. Sepsis, pneumonia, trauma, inhalation accounts for most of the recognized causes. And to go into detail again, to imprint this on your mind, if you're below a PFIO2 ratio of 100 with a confidence interval, a high confidence interval between 42 and 48 mortality rate, the mortality rate is 45%. For all intents and purposes, we could say 50% mortality rate. The older, the worse, the younger, the better. Let's keep that in mind. And again, this is the Berlin definition that's about six years old now. Again, it's either direct or indirect injury, and this accounts for most of these cases of ARDS. So again, low tidal volume is pretty much the standard. And it's been established now with the treatment of low tidal volume, it did result in a reduced mortality to 31%. So low tidal volume has been incorporated in conventional management. If you don't use low tidal volume, you ended up with this. You have extensive barotrauma. The patient is literally blown up. Now, any of you who remember the movie Stripes with Bill Murray, he was asked, what happened to your sergeant? He was blown up, sir. I don't know if you remember the movie, but this patient was blown up from excessive volume ventilation and pressure ventilation. If you don't remember that line from Stripes, rent the movie, you will laugh. John Candy was in the movie, and there's this famous line about a guy named Francis. Those of you who've seen the movie know what I'm talking about. The price of tidal volume. You have stress stretch injury. Uh, when you reduce the tidal volume, you reduce minute ventilation, you get a result of increase in carbon dioxide. We call it permissive hypercapnia. Some people think that might be dangerous. Not necessarily if the pH is okay. Atelectasis, worsening compliance, worsening hypoxemia. In the ARDSNET trial, in the first 48 hours, this was witnessed. But after the 72nd hour, things got better. And it resolved. And this is where the low tidal volume became pretty much standard. And today it is a standard, and it is absolutely worth it today. As far as drugs, nothing works. Corticoid steroids, no. No, speaking of no, inhaled nitric oxide, no benefit. However, you get some improved gas exchange, but overall no improvement in survival, no improvement on time on ventilator, and no improvement on time in the ICU. So let's focus on this improved gas exchange. We've heard many times today about time. Time heals all wounds, maybe. You know, let's give the patient some time to heal for their lungs to peel and then they're gonna heal. We need to buy some time for the patient and that's where ECMO may come in. I just read this Wall Street Journal article. You know, some of you don't know this, when I don't sleep at night I read. I just read this article and I actually had read most of the book last night. In Full Flight by John Hemingway. I highly re recommend you reading it. It's about a physician spurry, you know, with the Nazis, went down to Africa and started helping everybody. She became the mother doctor. Fabulous book. Time doesn't always heal new, new wounds. It, time doesn't always heal wounds, but you need to look at this book and understand this. None of these other drugs work. 
Other forms of ventilation, it doesn't matter. There's volume versus pressure. You can get into some arguments with everybody about what kind of ventilation would you want to provide your patient. Airway pressure release ventilation is kind of the new kid on the block, as was Apple Computer, as was Amazon. And then people think it's new, it's great. Well, there's no benefit and outcome right now. The hot thing was high frequency oscillation for adults. We know it works in kids. It doesn't work in adults. It failed. Liquid ventilation, I was around when it was around. It's still lingering in the background. It might be useful, but right now it doesn't matter the mode of ventilation. Keep the volume low, get the distension pressures adequate. Sometimes you might have to peep up the heavier patients. Fluids. The FACT trial, part of the ARDSnet said the conservative strategy is a winner. The CVP below four is better than the CVP above four. Dry the patients out a little bit. It improved lung function. It reduced, it increased ventilator free days, and it had no adverse renal effect as a lot of people had anticipated. Neuromuscular blockade came out of the French studies. Now, we joke about the French. When's the last time they won a war, revolutionary war? They didn't say Princess Die. You know, we can get into those cardiovascular surgery arguments. But they did show an improvement in survival. Remember that 40% survival to, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, 40% mortality improved and it went down to 30% or the survival was 60% at 90 days and now it's 70% in the paralyzed group. Their PFI2 ratio here was below 150, not 100. Never replicated, one time. Proning, wow, look at this improvement in survival. You know, 58% to 78% uh, survival. That's an impressive improvement in survival. Proning is a bit of a standard going around the country. This is, again, the French. You know, the same caveats. Hasn't been replicated, but there are other studies that have shown proning to be beneficial that it led to the strong recommendation. Uh, and I'm, let's focus on this recent position paper about proning and ARDS with a meta-analysis. What I want to show you, the PFI2 ratio in the prone group when they entered the study, the average, they're all above 100. So they're kind of moderate to severe. They're not severe. They're not below 100. See the difference? See the fine points that we need to pay attention to? In the days prior to proning, and in the hours that they prone, and this 11 is what come up, in blue is where they had a comparison group with standard ventilation comparisons. So that's an important point to bring up, and this was just recently published this past August. Look at the outcomes. So proning gives you a survival, I'm sorry, gives you a mortality rate of 23% to 30%, and I put it in blue here because these are the groups that had comparisons to conventional ventilation. The other point to make, if you're in a trial, you're gonna, you're gonna have better outcomes, and it bespeaks to what Peggy had mentioned before, you must follow a protocol. You know, and again, not all protocols are created equal. You know, there's going to be some precision medicine you're going to have to provide. But what people don't point out, look at the percentage of pressure sores. Look at the percentage of endotracheal tube obstruction, and there's also dislodgement. And again, the quality of evidence is high and high. Pay attention to this in a meta-analysis. So prone is highly recommended. It's endorsed with a strong recommendation. ECMO hasn't been confirmed, can't be refuted, not endorsed, but look at the complication rates. So let's go to refractory. Extracorporeal membrane, uh, membrane oxidation gives more time to heal. ECMO for sick lungs is what's been thrown around for years. Lungs need a break, and then ventilation is really for lung, uh, well lungs, particularly mechanical ventilation. The CSER trial was mentioned here, and again, you can see the survival rate uh, is improved from 49 to about 62 percent, you know, a 13 percent increase in survival. The control group did not have a standard ventilator protocol. That's, the, that's the, the criticism of this paper, and right now there is a trial ongoing in no other than France to answer that question, and that trial is about coming to close, so we don't know what the answer is going to be yet. Now, speaking of volume and pressure, I can play on words all day. This has nothing to do with how much volume goes into the patient. This has everything to do with how many ECMO cases you do per year in your program. The higher volume centers do have better outcomes. And the question is, is this the end or just the beginning of the story for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation? Well, let's take a look at UAB from, 9, from January 2, 2016 to today. 
We had 147 pla patients placed on ECMO in the last two years, 21 of them for ARDS. You know what's interesting? Dr. Hoop showed this earlier. 13% in San Francisco for ARDS. Here it's 15%, 16%. Post-op burns trauma, fulfilled criteria of ARDS, bacterial pneumonia, we had some influenza, septic, immune mediated. And remember, PFI2 ratio below 100, 40, 45, 50% mortality. Here's our PFI2 ratio average, 69. One patient was 112. If I throw that one patient out, it's 46 to 96, all below 100. This is much worse group than even in the prone study. PHPCO2, they're hypercatonic. What I don't have here is the pressures on ventilation. That one patient at 112 had plateau pressures. This was a 18, a body mass index of 18. So this was a small patient with plateau pressures at 40. And he was retaining CO2 to 80. So he, all, he, all he had left was to go on something else. And it was ECMO. 29% mortality. That's, the, that's an impressive response. And that's what you need to recognize. If you want to translate it into survival, which is not the correct thing to do, you would say 71% survival. That's not statistically the same as saying 29% mortality. This is impressive. One patient had, was a post-liver transplant with MRSA pneumonia and died the day after they got put on ECMO. Some people would argue that patient would not even be in the prone category. So if you throw that one patient out, then it's only five of 20 deaths, okay, 25% mortality. This just shows you the others. And, you know, for fairness, I would keep it in there. So here are the therapies for ARDS. And the focus here I got on ECMO in the prone position, and really the multicenter trial that needs to be thought about is comparing these two. Uh, and again, I already mentioned this, the French are about to complete this study, and the last update was January 2018, and we'll find out what they have done when they've deployed ECMO compared to standard mechanical ventilation. In summary, we have ARDS we talked about, ECMO for ARDS, I wonder where are we headed, or where are we headed, or where we are headed, or are we just beheaded? Thank you for your attention.